Hello, today we'll be discussing aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, including its workup and management. I'd like to thank my co-author, Caleb Wilson, who helped me in the development of this textbook chapter. I have to disclose that I am a member of the Speakers Bureau at Intersect ENT. And today I'll begin with a brief introduction to provide details about the scale and impact of AERD. I'll then take you through the salient clinical features of this disease process. This will be followed by a discussion of the diagnostic criteria for AERD. And finally, I'll provide a rubric for the utilization of the medical and surgical options in the management of this disease. So let's get into it. Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease is a chronic condition which manifests with several features, including airway reactivity, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, and hypersensitivity to aspirin and other selective COX-1 inhibitors. Upon ingestion of these substances, symptoms typically occur within 90 minute, uh, minutes of the exposure, affecting both the upper and lower respiratory tracts, as well as the GI tract and the skin. The prevalence of AERD is significant within the US population, affecting approximately 10% of patients who have nasal polyps, 7% of patients with asthma, and 15% of patients with severe asthma. Despite these data, current estimates suggest that this condition is relatively underdiagnosed due to the fact that the symptoms uh, present in concordance with other types of chronic rhinosinusitis. As a result, there's a, an approximately 10-year gap between the initial onset of symptoms and the eventual diagnosis of this condition. The quality of life impact of ARD is substantial, including morbidity to the lungs and several other organ systems that I'll later detail in this talk. In fact, 70% of patients report a significant impact on their quality of life as a result of their diagnosis. Critical to any discussion of ARD is a review of this pathogenesis. As you may recall from early biochemistry studies in medical school, uh, AERD is caused by aberrations in the arachidonic meta acid metabolism pathway. Arachidonic acid is an essential fatty acid that must be obtained by di from dietary sources, including omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. It's also a byproduct of muscle exertion, or I'm sorry, of physical exertion, and is one of the earliest breakdown products of, that's released during muscle contraction. Physiologically, when it's broken down, it can contribute to the production of prostaglandins as well as leukotrienes. In AERD, there's a predilection toward the pathway of leukotriene synthesis, whereby there's a higher level of eosinophilic inflammation as a result. This is best demonstrated in a pictorial format, as you see here. At baseline, patients with AERD have a constitutive upregulation of the COX-2 pathway, which results in higher levels of PGD, I'm sorry, prostaglandin D2, which is a potent cytokine of the T2 inflammatory pathway. Under normal conditions, um, COX-1 provides inhibition of the 5-lipoxygenase pathway, but in these patients, there's disinhibition and lower levels of PGE2 production. When the COX pathway is blocked by selective COX-1 inhibitors or other dietary salicylates, there's a shunting of arachidonic acid metabolism toward the 5-lipoxygenase pathway, thus resulting in the increased production of cis-leukotrienes, which are potent inflammatory cytokines in the T2 inflammatory pathway. So shown in a different way, the panel on the left shows the baseline state in AERD. In this disease, again, there's a um, relative lack of proxaglandin E2 production, which normally provides disinhibition. COX-2 is also regulated, uh, thereby having, uh, resulting in an upregulation of prostaglandin D2 production. With this disinhibition, you have increased leukotriene production, which then causes increased mast cell activity and degranulation, resulting in histamine release and smooth muscle, muscle contraction and bronchoconstriction. On the panel right, this baseline disease state is exacerbated even more with the introduction of selective COX-1 inhibitors. This results in even more leukotriene synthesis, greater levels of mast cell stimulation, and greater levels of histamine release and bronchoconstriction. 
clinically, patients who present uh, with this disease have progressive symptoms over time. And typically their nasal symptoms include congestion or obstruction, rhinorrhea, and loss of the senses of smell and taste. Asthma generally comes on later uh, with an average uh, time of onset approximately two years after the initial clinical presentation of their sinonasal symptoms. In addition, patients tend to have exacerbations when exposed to, exposed to NSAIDs or aspirin, resulting in GI symptoms, chest pain, flushing, and angioedema-like symptoms. When evaluating these patients, they should be queried about their previous reactions to aspirin or NSAIDs, as well as any tendency to avoid the use of these substances because of previous adverse reactions. Ear symptoms should also be evaluated because of the fact that the severe nasal polyposis that's present in this disease can cause obstruction of the eustachian tube orifice, thereby resulting in chronic nasal ear effusions, infections, and ear drainage. Diagnostically, there are three criteria that must be met for the diagnosis of ARD. Sinonasal polyps, which are oftentimes present on anterior rhinoscopy alone, but in very subtle conditions may uh, require sinonasal endoscopy. A diagnosis of asthma or airway reactivity is also present, and also confirmation of hypersensitivity to NSAIDs or aspirin. This can be denoted by at least one previous episode, but if the history is at all in, in question, patients should undergo a physician-observed aspirin challenge. An aspirin challenge is basically an incremental progressive administration of aspirin or NSAIDs in order to assess whether the symptoms may be provoked in a controlled environment. The starting dose is between 20 and 40 milligrams, and the typical provoking dose of symptoms is between 30 and 150 milligrams. Symptoms may occur within 30 to 60 minutes of their exposure uh, to the provoking dose. And if they're in the absence of any provoked symptoms, the dose is then incrementally increased every one to three hours up to a maximum dose of 650 milligrams. Aspirin exasperated respiratory disease is confirmed in the presence of any sort of respiratory reaction. And PFTs are utilized throughout the course of this testing in order to measure the patient's response to the challenge doses. Specifically, what's looked at is the force expiratory volume one, or FEV1, every 30 minutes. And once the provoking dose is reached, uh, they are then um, uh, subsequently measured for their FEV1 every 30 minutes up to 120 minutes. This is performed in order to ensure that the patient doesn't undergo any sort of significant respiratory reactions as a result of the testing prior to being discharged from clinic. Any decrease in FEV1 greater than 20% constitutes a positive reaction. Once the diagnosis of AERD is confirmed, we typically use a multimodal approach toward disease management and maintenance. The goal of these treatments is to maintain the symptoms at bay for as long as possible prior to or in consideration with uh, surgical intervention. We're all familiar with the different formulations of corticosteroids. There are intranasal steroids, which we typically use uh, for cytonasal inflammation, and held corticosteroids, which are very helpful in the maintenance of asthma. And then oral steroid burst and taper for the, for the treatment of any acute disease exacerbations. In the sinonasal cavity, steroids have been noted to decrease the number of mast cells and eosinophils in the sinonasal mucosa. And this results in improvement of the sinonasal polyp burden, as well as the sense of smell. Because of the aberrations in arachidonic acid, leukotriene modifying drugs have been utilized with great benefit in the treatment of AERD. These come in two flavors, both of which decrease the effect of leukotrienes in terms of their early and late phase responses. Subjectively, when these medications are used for up to six weeks, there's increased uh, benefit in terms of the sense of smell and nasal airflow. Alternatively, we may also use these medications during the course of aspirin challenge in order to decrease any, the risk of any significant adverse respiratory effects as a result of the testing. The first of these drug classes are leukotriene 
uh, receptor antagonists, including Montelukas and Zafirlukas. These work by inhibiting the cis leukotriene receptor one, which blocks the downstream effects of leukotrienes on airway inflammation. These have been noted to increase the FEV1 by up to 10% on average. However, they do come with some degree of caution. In the pediatric population, there have been noted to be neuropsychiatric rea reactions, including a risk of suicidal ideation in these patients. Despite this, the cost is very beneficial uh, at approximately $7 per day. Five lipoxin lipoxygenase inhibitors include the most uh, frequently used one is Zylutin. These decrease cis leukotriene synthesis, thereby improving FEV1 by over 20% on average. As far as adverse effects of these medications, there is a significant risk of hepatotoxicity, and therefore, the LFTs are, are typically obtained at baseline and subsequently every three to six months during the course of treatment. If it is observed, however, the hepatotoxicity is generally reversible, and once I move and stopped, the LFTs return to normal. From a cost standpoint, they're a little bit more uh, expensive than the uh, receptor antagonists at approximately $117 per day. Dietary modifications have also be, become a topic of um, great utilization uh, in the management of these patients. Consensus guidelines recommend the avoidance of selective COX-1 inhibitors universally in AERD patients. However, in addition, dietary non-acetylated salicylates should also be avoided because they selectively inhibit COX-2, uh, the COX-2 pathway that thereby resulting in airway inflammation. It is, however, quite difficult to avoid these substances overall because of the fact that dietary salicylates occur in very healthy foods, including those containing fiber, uh, potassium, and vitamin C, as you can see in the rubric here. In addition, there is a significant um, burden of these patients when intaking alcohol because of the fact that salicylates may all also be found in a lot of alcoholic beverages that are commercially available. So as far as the low salicylate diet, several benefits have been demonstrated to occur, including improved cyanonasal symptoms and asthma specific quality of life uh, as measured by the SNOT-22. Also physician observed measures, um, including the lung Kennedy endoscopic score uh, have also been noted to increase with six weeks of treatment. Alcohol should also be avoided as this has been noted to induce nasal and bronchial symptoms in up to 75% of patients. And finally, we advocate for the use of a, a diet that's high in omega-3 fatty acids because they do have an associated reduction of leukotriene production. Aspirin desensitization has been shown to be effective as an adjunct to surgery because it helps to maintain the result of those, those surgical procedures. This typically begins with a provocative aspirin challenge, which is followed by repeat exposures of increased doses until a threshold dose is reached. That dose is then cont continued long-term in order to maintain the patient and hopefully decrease the symptoms that they have over the course of time. It's unclear exactly how aspirin desensitization works, but in recent data has shown that these result in the decreased production of IL-4 which results in decreased bronchoconstriction and airway inflammation. This that chart demonstrates one such rubric for the initiation of the desensitization protocol. As you notice, the doses are in 40.5 milligram increments because these are the commercially available um, items that are available in the US. So at time zero, we typically start by introducing a 40.5 milligram dose. If they have no symptoms by 90 minutes, then a second dose of 81 milligrams is introduced. This is followed at 180 minute, uh, minutes with a 162 milligram dose, and finally at 270 minutes with 325. These doses are continued until the um, symptoms are provoked. And desensitization is defined as, a, as tolerance with repeated administration of the provocative dose and at least one subsequent dose. 
The indication for aspirin desensitization are the indications are intractable nasal symptoms or asthma despite appropriate medical therapies. It's instituted generally at two to 12 weeks following surgery. And again, this is performed in order to maintain the results of that surgical procedure. The adverse events have been noted, including epistaxis and dyspepsia most commonly occurring in up to 24% of patients. There's also the risk of loss of tolerance after discontinuation of aspirin for up to 72 hours. So if uh, aspirin is stopped at any point, patients do run the risk for severe respiratory reactions. As such, patients are counseled extensively about this risk and are informed that they must undergo repeat provocation and desensitization in the future if they have to stop aspirin. Uh, it does result in a higher healthcare related quality of life, decreased rate of polyp recurrence, and improved olfaction with 300 milligram doses following functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Biologic agents have been used to varying degrees of success in the control of T2 inflammation. Nepolizumab is one such agent. It's an IL-5 inhibitor. It has benefit in controlling nasal and respiratory symptoms in AERD patients with severe eosinophilic asthma. Omalizumab is an anti-IgE monoclonal antibody that binds free IgE, thereby resulting in decreased degranulation of mast cells and basophils. This is associated with a 76% decrease in leukotriene urinary concentrations, presumably reflecting the serum concentrations given that patients also have improved cyanonasal symptoms while on this medication. Dupilumab is another agent that binds the receptor for IL-4 and IL-13, resulting in improvement in FEV1, lung Mackay scores, and SNOT-22 scores. Moving on to surgical management, this is an important tool in the management of AERD because although it's uh, rarely utilized as a standalone uh, treatment modality, it's generally used as an adjunct to medical therapies. And following surgery, patients have been noted to have improvement of their leukotriene and prostaglandin levels, uh, leading to less severe as uh, reactions to aspirin desensitization. The goals of surgery are threefold. Number one, you want to remove all polyps and infection. Secondarily, you want to provide a route for the delivery of any topical rinses and corticosteroids. And finally, we try to maintain the patency of the sinonasal cavities long term. The most appropriate means of achieving these goals has been a source of debate. Specifically, people have argued in favor of performing an upfront draft three versus traditional FES for enlargement of the frontal sinus ostium. This is because there has been noted to be a higher risk of failure in traditional endoscopic sinus surgery without draft three relative to those who undergo draft three procedures. With that being said, in AERD, 58% of patients who undergo a draft three have polyp regrowth and 28% require revision surgery within four years. Because of this, my typical approach is to perform an upfront draft 2B where I open up the frontal sinus ostium and resect the floor of the frontal sinus from the lamina papricia to the midline, including takedown of the middle turbinate stump. Following this, I generally try to follow up with either a biologic agent or aspirin desensitization in order to maintain the long-term result. This has not yet been borne out in the data, but there are several randomized controlled randomized control trials that will be looking at this specifically in the future. Blood loss is one of my greatest concerns when it, uh, performing these surgeries because of the burden of polyps that can cause uh, intraoperative bleeding. Because of this, I do administer steroids four days preoperatively to decrease the risk. I also discontinue aspirin universally in all these patients, but I always make sure that I have a plan for the re-implementation of the aspirin desensitization protocol. Finally, one of the things that I always talk to my residents about is the use of curved uh, instrumentation and angled endoscopes in order to completely visualize the sinus ostia as well as the polyps that are within the sinus cavities. Specifically, I talk about the use of reverse post endoscopes. 
And these, with these scopes, the light post is headed in the same direction as the angle on the scope. This allows for unimpeded access to the sinus cavities with the passage of current instruments. And it also allows for visualization of the distal tip of the instrument in order to ensure that it's being used in an appropriate fashion. This, is, uh, this chart actually demonstrates this. So in the maxillary sinus, I typically use either a 45 or 70 degree endoscope, whereas my angle debriders are gonna be 60 or 120. The sphenoid sinus, uh, I use a zero or a 30 degree endoscope and then a 40 degree debrider. And then the frontal sinus, 30, 45 or 70 degree endoscopes with a 60 or 90 degree debrider. So again, the curvature of the instrument shaft has to be greater than the, the angle on the endoscope and this promotes visualization. I set up my OR suite with ergonomics in mind. As you note here, I have a standing mat that I utilize because these cases can be very long in duration. This decreases the stress on one's knees, hips, and ankles. I also drop the height of the screens as low as possible because the normal resting anatomical position of the eye is 15 degrees below the horizontal. So this reduces neck strain and eye strain during the course of these procedures. When draping the patient, I use what's called a U-drape where the light and camera cords go over the vertex of the scalp, this um, decreases the likelihood that the cords would impede access to the nasal cavity during the course of the dissection. As far as patient preparation, again, blood loss is a major concern. So I utilize one to 1,000 adrenaline soaked budgets, but I stain these um, with fluorescein preoperatively in order to let everyone in the room know that this is not to be injected. It's a very uh, significant uh, safety concern and um, the residents and the staff alike are, are very cognizant of this throughout the course of the procedure. I also perform injections with 1% lidocaine with epinephrine at the middle turbinate, the sphenopalatine foramen, and also the greater palatine canal. In the GPC injection, I bend the needle 45 degrees, two centimeters from the tip of the needle. To demonstrate this, I'd like to take you through a case that presented to my clinic recently. This was a 28 year old gentleman with a history of chronic nasal obstruction, asthma and extensive nasal polyposis on anterior rhinoscopy. He endorsed an intolerance to NSAIDs and aspirin, which had caused major respiratory reactions in the past, as well as GI upset and wheezing. But in addition to this, he had no improvement of his symptoms with courses of systemic steroids and topical irrigations. And he declined aspirin desensitization because of the major adverse reactions that he had previously had. I did attempt to put him on dupilumab as a biologic agent, but this was not approved by insurance. So this left me to the point of proceeding with um, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, including a draft 2 b When doing my preoperative um, assessment, I always get a CT a scan of the paranasal sinuses. And in this CT scan, I noted several uh, potential anatomical issues. First, there was a prominent intersinus septal cell and a septal deviation, which could potentially limit access to the left middle meatus. There was also a dehiscence of the left orbit due to expansion of the middle meatus with polyps. And finally, the skull base was asymmetrically high on the left side relative to the right, resulting in a low-lying anterior ethmoid artery. The other thing that I noticed here was that there was significant heterogeneity within the paranasal sinuses, which raised the question of whether there was concordant allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. This concordant presentation has been observed in other case series, including this one presented in 2020, where you had overlapping endotypes of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. This was confirmed on microscopic examination with tissue eosinophilia and allergic mucin and non-invasive fungal elements. In these patients, the authors argue for long-term maintenance on anti-IL-5 and aspirin desensitization. I generally begin these cases with a biopsy of the polyp tissue at the front of the nose. This allows me to get an eosinophil count, but it also allows me to evaluate for the presence of a sinonasal uh, uh, tumor or other diagnosis that may be present. 
I'm typically very micro debris or heavy in these cases because it allows me to clear space while also uh, clearing blood from the surgical field. As you can see, the untreated process has been reflected anteriorly due to the burden of polyposis within the middle meatus, but access to the meatus is limited by the septal deviation. In order to avoid struggling, I made the decision at this point to perform a septoplasty to gain uh, greater access to the meatus. I perform my septoplasties endoscopically in almost all cases. I think that this is a helpful uh, tool in teaching residents, but it also allows me to visualize the areas of concern much uh, easier. In this case, there was a prominent of the superior septum anteriorly, which I take down here. But there was also a prominent maxillary spine and maxillary crest, which limited access more inferiorly. Removing this tissue is very, um, it's usually very quick. Uh, you don't have to take down much of the anterior septum and I try to maintain the cartilaginous strut to prevent any nasal collapse. Here you can see the middle meatus has been opened greater and it's really filled with mucinous debris and polyposis. Again, I'm a little bit more debrider heavy in, in these cases. I usually prefer cold steel instrumentation, but because of the degree of blood loss, this allows me to operate a little bit more quickly. Um, of course, making sure to keep my debrider superior, superior facing to avoid any injury to the orbital contents or the skull base. Once I have the anterior ethmoid cells opened up, I then use a blank sleeve to remove any infectious debris and polyp contents. At this point, I move toward the maxillary antrosomy, removing the, uncinate, the horizontal aspect of the uncinate process back to the crista ethmoid alice. Once this is performed, I use the backbiting forceps or the micro backbiter in this case. And I perform what's called a stair step um, where I take my bites low posteriorly and progressively more superiorly and anteriorly. I disarticulate the untenor process from the lateral nasal wall using the 90 degree blanks and forceps. And I find this instrument also very helpful in removing polyps from the internal aspect of the maxillary antrum. Once this was performed in this patient, I was immediately cognizant of the fact that there was mucinous debris completely filling the maxillary sinus. So I left this for later. I turn my attention at this point toward the dissection of the uh, ethmoid septations from the lateral nasal wall. Again, because there is that the hissence of the lamina papyrusia, there is a risk for an orbital injury. So in this case, I use the 90 degree blakes and forceps directed with a push pull in a push pull fashion to get these septations to release. In doing so, I'm able to dissect those septations without uh, getting through the lamina papyrusia. And it also uh, provides exposure for the uh, polypoid edema to be resected using the microdebrider. There are more mucinous contents encountered posteriorly in the posterior ethmoid. And once beyond the basal lamella, I can take down the posterior ethmoid septations that have been pneumatized into the maxillary antrum. Once this is performed, I spend time cleaning up the posterior ethmoid cells, getting back into the sphenoethmoidal recess in order to provide unimpeded access to the sphenoid sinus. Again, this is a little bit more debrider heavy than I'm typically used to because of the fact that the blood is welling up in the surgical field. And time is a little bit of the essence because of um, the need to perform the dissection on both sides. Once this is adequately opened up, um, I turn my attention then to the sphenoidotomy. And in this case, I use a two-handed technique um, with my resident holding the endoscope because it allows me to suction blood while also uh, widening the sphenoidotomy out to the orbital apex and superiorly to the level of the skull base. Once I have that depth uh, completely uh, visualized and noted, I'm then able to um, take down the 
residual posterior ethmoid septations uh, more safely because I've defined the level of the skull base um, and I, I know where the orpex, uh, orbital apex is coming in laterally so as to not cause an injury in those areas. As far as the debrider, again, the angle of the sphenoid sinus can be between 20 and 40 degrees relative to the horizontal. So for this purpose, I use the uh, 40 degree micro debrider to remove any polyploid or infectious contents from the base of the sinus cavity. Moving them back to the maxillary antrum, I'm now wide in space. And clearly I'm using a frontal dissector with an angled endoscope to remove the mucinous contents. I'm basically defining the level between the mucosa and the, uh, the mucinous debris. And this allows for delivery of those contents into the nasal cavity as one uh, large chunk rather than several smaller chunks. Once this is removed, the, the sinus cavity is debrided of polypoid uh, tissue using the 60 or 120 degree debrider and the sinus cavity is irrigated out. So now I've turned toward the frontal recess, the section. This is a 45 degree uh, endoscope with uh, the 60, I'm sorry, the uh, 70 degree suction, which is navigated, which I use to find the frontal recess. In these cases, a lot of times the polyps have done a lot of the dissection for you and you're able to seek out the internal frontal ostium without much difficulty. Care must be taken in these cases to um, remove all infectious debris. And then subsequently um, palpate the eye to ensure that uh, no damage is being done. With the zero degree endoscope, I was not able to remove all of the superiorly based ethmoid septations, but with the angled endoscope, I can see these much greater. And I do this dissection either using the um, curved suction uh, in a blunt fashion or the Hosman forceps or giraffe forceps to remove tissue. In this case, I'm using the 70 degree uh, endoscope to visualize superiorly within the cavity as well as the giraffe forceps to take down those septations. From a micro debrider standpoint, I utilize the 60 or the 90 degree debriders to remove all the polypoid tissue from the sinus cavity. And I'm opening up everything from the lamina papyrusia medially to the uh, midline. Here I see a little bit of residual middle turbinate stump, which is taken down with the debrider and the husband rangeur. This is important because it allows me to also address that anterosinus septal cell that I noted radiographically at the beginning of the case. Once I'm able to enter into the cell, I come over the top of it with the Hosman forceps, taking down its roof and creating a confluent communication between the inner sinus septal cell and the uh, remainder of the frontal sinus. Once this tissue is removed, I then inspect to make sure that there's no residual inflammatory tissue or infectious contents. I irrigate the sinuses and then I proceed with packing the cavity. From a packing standpoint, I use momentazone impregnated stents in order uh, to maintain the passageway, but also deliver steroid topically over the course of 25 to 35 days. I do so in a similar fashion with the maxillary antrum. And with this, I position the stent as anteriorly as possible with the, ace wank, uh, the waist anchored as far anteriorly as possible against the posterior aspect of the lacrimal crest. This is best achieved using the maxillary ostium seeker. Once I'm happy with the defect, I then pack with the chitis and base pack, which uh, has been very helpful in minimizing perioperative blood loss. I have patients start their nasal rinses at post-operative day zero or one. Um, and this has been helpful in minimizing the amount of debridement that's required at their post-operative visits. Here you have the dorsal splint going in and that's secured anteriorly in a transeptal fashion. So in conclusion, ARD is a severe endotype of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis that presents significant challenges in management. Multimodal therapy is generally recommended, including long-term maintenance medications. But when these medications fail, 
they must be uh, accompanied by surgery. The optimal management strategy must be tailored to the individual patient because of their tolerance to different medications, as well as their comfort with things such as aspirin desensitization. So the three diagnostic criteria of AERD includes chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, aspirin uh, hypersensitivity and airway reactivity to dietary and medical salicylates. An aspirin challenge may be required to confirm this diagnosis. Glucotrine modifying agents are very effective at maintaining the results of surgery, but aspirin desensitization and other biologic agents are also helpful in this regard. Finally, surgery should be performed with careful consideration of blood loss, as well as an appreciation for anatomic variations when they exist. This article by White and Stevenson summarizes the material that I've presented in my talk today and would be a good resource for you to use in the future. And here are my sources. I thank you for your time and hope this talk has been useful for you in the management of AERD patients moving forward.